So today I'm going to be talking you through a new Python tool for thermobarometry called Thermobar. Now if you're interested you can access this tool on GitHub, so if you go to uh, my GitHub, Penny Weezer, and then you can click on Thermobar, and what you'll find is all of the code is here, and most importantly there's this examples folder which you can click on, and then there's examples for lots of different phases including the example we're going to do today. And if you want to download this onto your computer, you would simply click on this code button and then press download zip. So today I'm going to run this in Jupyter Lab, which is my preferred Python tool. So I'm just going to launch that up through my Anaconda PowerShell prompt. Just going to take a second. So Anaconda is the easiest way to install Python if you haven't done it before and you've never used Python before. So I'm launching Jupyter Lab and it will pop up in my browser. Okay, once JupyterLab has launched, it will look like this. So you have your different workbooks along the top here. And then you have your file structure, which is a mimic of the file structure in your PC on the left hand side. So what you'll want to do is you'll want to take that zip folder from GitHub, you'll want to unzip it, put it somewhere in your PC, and then navigate to it using this file structure. So for example, I put it in a folder called My Barometers, and then it's this folder Thermobar Outer. And then what we're interested in doing today is going into this example folder and then double clicking on this five minute intro .ipymb notebook. So this is a Jupyter notebook. It allows you to have text cells like this where I can write instructions and then code cells which have these little numbers next to them. At the top you have various tools. You have the kernel which you can restart and this is basically like your MATLAB equivalent of clearing everything. You have um, various things you can uh, add a cell using this button. You can delete a cell there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import three important Python things. So we're going to import pandas as PD and pandas allows you to sort of treat data a bit like a spreadsheet and pull out columns easily. We're going to import numpy which is kind of used for math in Python and then we're going to import matplotlib as PLT and this is what we're going to use for plotting. So to run any cell you can press this run button here or on Windows you can press shift enter. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get the thermobar code onto your computer. Now you have just installed it from GitHub, but this means that you will have it always and you can work in different folders with your own scripts, no problem. So we use pip to install. And again, we're gonna run that. And then that's gonna take um, a while to install the first time, but once you've installed it, you never need to run this again unless you want to update. And in which case, we're just going to comment it out, which is putting this hash symbol, and then that will, cell will no longer run. So then what we have to do is we've installed Thermobar on our computer. Now we need to import it locally into the script so that we can use its functions. So we import Thermobar as PT. And this means anytime we want to call a function from Thermobar or do anything with Thermobar, we type PT dot. So you can see we import this. And say, for example, we want to know what version of Thermobar we're using, we can type pt.version and it'll tell you you're using version 0.5 development. So the way Thermobar works is it reads from an Excel file. So let's have a look at this Excel file just so I can show you what it looks like we're going to be working on today. So you want to go to this five minute intro Excel. So the ideal sort of data entry for Thermobar, you have a sample ID. So these are some uh, experiments from Sisson and Grove. And then you identify your different phases using the oxide names and then an underscore for the phase. So these are all liquid phases. And then you come along and these are coexisting Kleiner peroxines. It's got underscore CPX. For iron, it only deals with um, iron total and then you can set a proportion of iron 3 plus. So make sure that your column is FeO total underscore liquid. Okay, so uh, for the way, you don't have to have these in a certain order. You could have the silica content of the liquid, the silica content of the CPX next to it and whatever you want. Python will find the right columns and segment them out. And that is done using this function, import Excel. So what you need to tell it is you need to tell it your file name, so in this case, five minute intro, and you need to tell it the sheet name. 
And what this does is it returns a dictionary, which we have called out here. And this dictionary contains a number of data frames. You can basically consider a pandas data frame as like a little Excel sheet. So the first data frame um, that is stored with an out, and we can access this by using out and then square brackets and then the name of the sort of key in the dictionary. So in this case, my input. This records all of the columns that you entered without any additional formatting. We then have liquids, and this is accessed using the key licks. And what this does is it pulls out any of those column headings with underscore liquid and arranges them in a specific order that allows it to be fed into the functions easily. The same for CPXs. This pulls out any um, compositions which have CPX in. And the list, the full list of phase identifiers you can see here. So we're going to run this. Now, it, you might think it's a bit of a nightmare to have to add underscore liquid and underscore CPX. The reason we've done this is for when you have coexisting phases like this, it reduces ambiguity. If you only have one phase, so for example, in this lick no header thing, I'm only interested in the liquid. For example, I might want to perform liquid only thermometry. So it's a bit unnecessary to have to add underscore liquid to the end of all these columns. So what you can do is use the same function. You say the name of the file, the sheet name, and this time we're just gonna say, here's the suffix I want you to add rather than having to add it by hand. And that would allow you, um, using this step underneath, to pull out um, a data frame of liquids which is ready to go. Anytime you want to have a look at your data frame in JupyterLab, just make a new cell, put the name of it and press run. And here you can see it has now added this liquid, so it's ready to go into all the functions. Whenever you load data in, you should always inspect it. And if we remember above, we had segmented out this variable licks and this variable CPXs. And we just want to check, for example, maybe you've got a strange subscript that's come from a journal, maybe like the AL is actually a one, and that means that Python hasn't recognized it. So you can use this head function, and this pulls out the first five rows, and then display so that both of these print. So we can have a look, and we can look along, and we can see there's all these additional uh, columns of zeros that have been added to your liquids. And that's because you didn't specify these in your input. So it's assumed that the proportion of Fe3 plus is zero, that nickel oxide is zero, cobalt oxide is zero, and CO2 is zero. And the reason for this is just to make sure that we've got a set data input that we can use for all functions and all thermobarometry equations. You can see for CPX, we can look along and see the only sort of empty column is potassium and CPX, which we didn't have in our spreadsheets. That's why it's filled it with zeros. So anytime you want any help uh, with how specific functions work, what inputs they require, you can type help, PT, and then the name of the function. If you run that, you can see uh, it sort of gives you the function and the inputs here, and then it gives them in more detail here. So it says you need to give it a CPX composition, which is a data frame, and that is what we extracted out up here. You need to give it a liquid composition, or you can give it a merged data frame, which is used in some of the functions later on. You then need to pick an equation for temperature, and these are the different equations which are included in Thermovar. Finally, you might have to give it a pressure for pressure sensitive thermometers. Um, and you can also specify equilibrium tests. Bool means that there are two options, true or false. By default, it's false. But if you type ec tests is true, it will return not only your calculated temperature, but also the value of all equilibrium tests. Similarly, say uh, you look at this and you say, oh, well, I think I want to choose um, T. Paterka 2008, equation 33, which is here. You can get a little bit more information about what this is by typing help PT and then its name. And here you can basically see what goes into calculating um, the temperature using this equation and the standard error if it was given in the original paper. Okay, so as sort of a first example, let's say we want to calculate um, a clinoproxene liquid pressure based on those already paired up with CPXs and liquids. So on the left hand side, we give it the name which we want to call it. So here we're calculating pressure using equation 30 at 1300 Kelvin. So we say PT, so that's thermobar, 
the function is called calculate CPX lick pressure. We then have to tell it the cop CPX compositions we want to use. So in this case, we called that CPXs. The liquid compositions, in this case, we loaded these in as licks. Equation P is P per turk, 2008, equation 30, and temperature in Kelvin is 1300. So you can run that, and you can see, if you just want to look what this looks like, this is just a list of pressures in kilobar as a panda series. Similarly, if we want to calculate temperature for these CPX liquid pairs, uh, we can use equation 33. We want to evaluate it at 5 kilobar. We would say PT calculate CPX lick temperature, the same thing here. The only difference being we swapped equation T and equation P, given it the name of the thermometer we want and told it the pressure we want to operate at. Now in reality, unless you're an experimentalist, you're not going to know pressure or temperature. So we can use the function calculate CPX lick pressure temperature. And same as before, you give it your CPX compositions, your liquid compositions, you tell it an equation for P and an equation for T. And it returns it as a pandas data frame. So now you've got two columns. So we could plot these pressures and temperatures using matplotlib, which we loaded in as PLT. And anytime you sort of want to access a column from a data frame, you take the data frame name, so PT ITA 3033, and then the column name goes within square brackets with quote marks. So here we're plotting the pressure on the x-axis and the temperature on the y-axis. And we've labelled the x and y-axis to show that. Now the rest of this tutorial just goes through some input warnings. So for example, if your column headings don't have capitals, it will give you a warning saying that. And then various things like if you don't have an FEO total column, it will also return a warning. Um, so it'll return a hard error saying, I won't proceed any further until you've labelled your column FEO total. This might seem a bit harsh, but this is because often with GeoRock, there is ambiguity. There's an FEO, an FEOT, an FE2A3 column, and it's really unclear what should be being used. So the idea is as a user, you know where you got your iron data from. You're the best one to work it out rather than Python.